Hello, this is Pastor Stephen Anderson from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. And this video is a response to this lying video online that claims that there are 75 Bible verses that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the earth is flat. Now, obviously that's ridiculous. The earth is a globe, the earth is not flat. But let me just start out by saying this. A tactic that liars will often use is that they will just come at you with this mountain of supposed evidence instead of just bringing you two, three, four things that actually have some kind of uh, merit to them. They'll just come at you with just so many things so that people will just think, oh, wow, there's, if there's that many verses, they can't all be wrong. But when you actually look at each verse, none of them prove that the earth is flat whatsoever. And that's why I've printed out a list of all 75 verses used in this video. And these are the same verses that all these other you know, flat earthers will come at you with, and it, it, it's nonsense, okay? Now, let me start out by just saying that the video and the video maker are complete liars because these are not 75 verses that prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that the earth is flat, quote unquote. And let me just start out with just a list of just irrelevant verses that are in this video, because I, I have to cover every verse in the video well, first of all, here's one of the 75 verses that they say proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that the earth is flat. Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. What does that have to do with the flat earth? Absolutely nothing. And I have a whole page of verses like that that they quote as part of their 75 verses that prove a flat earth. So the point is that they're just coming at you with, it's sort of like when atheists will say, oh, the Bible's filled with contradictions. Oh, there's just a mountain of, of contradictions. But then when you look at each one, they fall apart. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of science falsely so called. 1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. You say, well, why are you reading, Pastor Anderson, these irrelevant verses that have nothing to do with the flat earth? Well, you know, you tell me. I'm just debunking the 75 verses that supposedly prove that it's flat. And this just goes to show that the guy's lying right away because these verses don't prove that the earth is flat. He's just trying to inflate this huge number, 75. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Matthew 24, 24, For there shall rise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Come on, Pastor Anderson, debunk the flat earth. Well, these are the verses that he used. So first I have to read through all these irrelevant verses before I can even get into the verses that uh, actually would be twisted to say that the earth is flat. But th this is what he provided in the video, 75 verses proving a flat earth. Ephesians 5, verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Psalm 147, 5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Luke 18, 17, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Now tell me, did any of those verses say anything about the earth being flat? No. But these are on a list of 75 Bible verses that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the earth is flat. That should show you right there that the guy is a liar. Okay, and then another point that he makes, because I'm going to go through every single point, is he again floods the screen with a big list of 67 Bible verses about the sun moving. And he says, well, these don't really prove that, you know, the earth's flat, but they at least prove geocentricity. So he's kind of moving the goalpost, talking about a different subject. But here's what's funny about that. If you actually look up these verses about the sun moving, None of them say, the sun moved. This is what they actually say. They say the sun goes up and the sun goes down is what they talk about, okay? Well, here's the thing. If you look at the model that the flat earthers show you of the sunrise and sunset, 
the sun is not literally going up and going down, is it? On their model, the sun just kind of floats around in a circle. So if they were actually taking these verses literally as they claim, then, you know, where's the sun going up and going down? Obviously, the sun going up and going down is from the viewpoint of the person who's standing on the earth. It appears to go up and appears to go down. And even according to their own model, it's not literally going up and down. So that proves nothing about a flat earth. And the guy even admits in the video, well, admittedly, these 67 don't prove a flat earth. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, another point that he makes in this video is with Isaiah 11, verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So he says, see, the earth has corners. That proves that it's flat. Well, here's what's funny about that. It says that God is going to gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, according to the flat earthers, this is what the corners look like, okay? So they pull out this model where the earth is sort of like a chips and dips bowl. It's this round earth, but that it has this square around it. And then it has these angels on the four corners. Another verse he brings up is Revelation 7.1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So it shows them here, these angels on the four corners, saying, see, this is what the Bible is talking about. But here's the problem with that. If Isaiah 11 verse 12 is saying that he's going to gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, then that would mean that Jews would have to be living on those corners, okay? So you see their little ice ring that they always talk about, the Antarctica ice ring? So I guess the Jews somehow got beyond the ice ring and are just hanging out on those corners on the edges. Now that doesn't make any sense, does it? Because according to these flat earthers, that corner is uninhabited because no one can get past the ice ring of supposed Antarctica. And, you know, I feel like an, I feel like an idiot even talking about this, but honestly, you, somebody has to respond to this stuff because the, there's all these videos all over the Internet claiming that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat. So gathering the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth, well, that picture goes out the window then, doesn't it? Because there wouldn't be any Jews hanging out on those four corners. They'll also bring out Revelation 20, verse 8. He should go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So again, the nations are living in those corners. That doesn't make any sense. Here's the answer. Listen to this. Leviticus 19, 27 says this. You shall not round the corners of your head, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Now, is your head flat? Is your head a flat disc? Absolutely not. Yet the Bible says not to round the corners of your head. So here's my question. If your head can have corners, isn't it possible that the earth could have corners as well? See, it's just a misunderstanding of the word corner. The word corner not only refers to, you know, a square's sharp edges. The word corner actually can also mean region or quadrant. Okay, so that makes sense not to mar the corners of your head. It's talking about different parts of your head and the four corners of the earth are talking about different parts of the earth, different quadrants of the earth. That's why it says in Revelation 28, the four quarters of the earth instead of corners of the earth because it's just referring to a section or quadrant of a sphere, sort of like your head, which is more like a sphere than a flat disc, at least mine is. Uh, let's move on to the next proof that they give. First Chronicles 16.30 says this, Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Now, they misinterpret this verse to say that the earth is not moving. And they call this the still earth. You know, the Bible teaches a still earth. But here's the thing, that verse does not say that the earth is not moving. It says that the earth shall be stable, that it be not moved. Now, that it be not moved is talking about being moved by an outside force. Let me prove it to you. Let me just keep reading. Uh, Psalm 96 verse 10 is another verse they use for this. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Psalm 93 1, the Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. 
the world also has established that it cannot be moved. So they say that these verses are saying that the earth is not moving, but that's not what they say. It says that they, the earth shall not be moved. Now, let me give you some other Bible verses. Let's compare scripture with scripture. Psalm 10, verse 6. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Psalm 15, 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Now again, first of all, even if the Bible did say that the earth didn't move, that would still not prove that the earth is flat. That would just prove geocentricity, which is also false. But again, they're moving the goalpost. They're claiming that these are 75 Bible verses that prove a flat earth. The earth not moving doesn't prove that, number one. But number two, it says the earth shall not be moved, but then what about when David said, I shall not be moved? What about when the Bible says that the man who puts out his money to usury shall not be moved? What about when the Bible says in Psalm 21, 7, for the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Is that saying that that man is just stationary and never moves? I mean, if I as a believer shall not be moved, according to all these verses, Psalm 62, 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. He only is my rock and my salvation. He's my defense. I shall not be moved. Psalm 66, 9, which holdeth our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. Does that say that Christians' feet never move? We're just frozen? I mean, maybe we're stationary and the whole universe is moving around us. I mean, that's ridiculous. But they're using the exact same verses to claim that the earth doesn't move of people that shall not be moved. The earth shall not be moved. It's talking about being acted upon by an outside force. It's stable in its orbit, okay? It is established in its path. Just as we as Christians are established, are stable in our path, and shall not be moved. It says that even more than about the earth. Psalm 112, verse 6, Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Psalm 121, verse 3, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Proverbs 12, 3, A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. I suppose these flat earthers who want to just take this overly literal view of poetic verses, when it says the root of the righteous shall not be moved, I guess they would say that, you know, we all have physical roots like tree roots that never move. I mean, that's what it says. The root of the righteous shall not be moved. Let's move on. So we've shown that the earth not being moved does not prove that the earth isn't moving. It's talking about not being moved by something else acted upon by an outside force. Let's move on. The next point that they make is about the ends of the earth. Job 37, 3, he directeth it unto the whole heaven and is lightning unto the ends of the earth. Daniel 4, 11, the tree grew and was strong and the height thereof reached unto heaven and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. Proverbs 30, verse 4, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name if thou canst tell? Jeremiah 16, 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Now again, if they're going to say that the ends of the earth is somehow the edges of a flat earth, well, the Bible says that the Gentiles shall come from the ends of the earth. So then Gentiles would have to be coming from Antarctica according to them. Or Gentiles would have to be coming from these uninhabited corners, according to them. And that makes no sense. Honestly, what they're missing here on this ends of the earth thing is that the Bible defines the earth as dry land, and that's usually how it's used in the Bible. So when the Bible says the word earth, it's usually not talking about the planet earth. It's actually talking about the dry land. Because, for example, in Genesis 1 verse 9, it says, And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. So the earth is in contrast to the seas. The earth is the dry land, the seas are the waters. So to sit there and say the ends of the earth proves that the earth is a disk or a square that has edges is ridiculous because of the fact 
that it talks about God bringing the Gentiles from the ends of the earth. Now, it makes more sense that God is talking about the dry land, the ends of the dry land, like where the dry land stops and the sea begins. Those would be the ends of the earth. That's why he says in Psalm 67, 7, God shall bless him, us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. So people would have to be living at the ends of the earth for these verses to be true, which is the case because the end of the earth is where the sea begins. He called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the water calls he seas. Uh, it says in Psalm, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 41, 5, the isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. And I could go on and on with that point. It's just a misunderstanding that the earth is the dry land, not, not the planet. And that's where the flat earthers make a lot of mistakes, in fact, not understanding that simple point. Okay, let's move on to the pillars of the earth. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. Now, first of all, let me just point out the context of this passage. This is not God telling us about the nature of the universe or about the earth and its situation. This is actually Hannah praying to God. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 2 where Hannah is praying for God to give her a child. And basically she's thanking God that he's answered her prayer. So she's praying and, and says the statement about the pillars of the earth of the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. So it's kind of funny that I guess God would give us that truth in some woman's prayer. It's not even God talking. And people in the Bible have been known to make mistakes, number one. But not only that, listen to this, Job 9, verse 6, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. Okay, so when we talk about shaking the earth out of his place and the pillars thereof trembling, Again, we're talking about the dry land because remember, we already looked at a bunch of verses that talk about the earth not being moved, the earth being stable in the sense of the planet is stable. But earth referring to the dry land on tectonic plates, there are of course earthquakes where the earth is shaken out of its place and the pillars thereof tremble, showing that the pillars of the earth are basically pillars under the dry land. And I'm gonna go into that in a moment with more scripture. But listen to this, Psalm 75 verse 3, the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah. So they're using this verse to show that the Bible is teaching that the earth is literally this flat disk sitting upon pillars. Well, no, actually the Bible says that God hangeth the earth upon nothing. And that's actually the truth. So the Bible is scientifically accurate that the earth is hanging on nothing. But they're saying, well, no, this is literal pillars holding up a flat disk of an earth. This, this proves the earth's flat. But here's the problem with that. It says in Psalm 75, 3, the earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. Selah. So if you're going to take this verse literally, then you'd be saying that Asaph, the writer of the psalm, is under those pillars lifting them up because he said, I bear up the pillars of it. So obviously this is poetic because a human being can't lift up the entire earth on pillars, can he? No, that's ridiculous. So it's obviously poetic, number one. So these verses about the pillars of the earth are clearly poetic, clearly not literal. But there is some literal explanation to this anyway if you want to talk about pillars being under the dry land or under the earth. Because listen to this from Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. And said, I cried by, my, by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. He heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So Jonah is talking about crying out of the belly of hell. And then he says in Jonah 2 verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So notice Jonah says that the earth with her bars was about him forever. Well, bars and pillars are both synonymous. They're both, you know, rods of metal, basically. So in this scripture, it says the earth with her bars was about me forever. So speaking from hell, and obviously Jonah was not literally in hell. Jonah was in the whale's belly, but it's prophetic where the son of man would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
out of the belly of hell. Okay. Well, according to the Bible, hell is in the lower parts of the earth or the heart of the earth. Okay. So if the earth looks like this, which we know that it does, on the inside of this, it's all fire and brimstone, which makes perfect sense because the Bible says that hell is in the heart of the earth. Okay. Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Son of man, Jesus Christ, would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay. Well, think about it. If you were in the heart of the earth, if you were in hell, then you could say the earth with her bars was about me forever. What's about me? Around me. So that proves that the earth is a sphere anyway, because if you're in hell, the earth is all around you. The earth with her bars was about me forever when he's at down below the bottoms of the mountains, etc. So again, the bars, the pillars are just basically foundational structure underneath the crust of the earth or you know, underneath the bedrock where no man has ever gone before, of course, because we've never even reached the mantle um, as human beings. So basically, you know, sort of like concrete has rebar in it. There's obviously some kind of, you know, rods or bars down below us in the earth. Okay. But here's the thing. It's either that or all of these are just figurative since he talks about lifting up the pillars. So there are plenty of explanations for that. Besides, you know, proving beyond any shadow of a doubt that the earth is flat. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Isaiah 24, verse 18, And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. Again, the foundations of the earth shaking, this has to do with plate tectonics, this has to do with an earthquake, and this has to do with them misunderstanding that the earth is referring to the dry land. It's not referring to the entire planet as a whole shaking. It's talking about the earth, the ground, the dirt shaking, okay? But they're also making a point here of, well, you know, the windows of heaven, the windows from on high, that proves the earth's flat. Well, how does that prove that the earth's, I don't get it. The window, well, because the dome and the and the firmament and all this. Look, again, moving the goalpost, okay? They want to talk about something that's going on in the sky as proving that they're this flat. First of all, and, and let me just read the firmament verse while I'm on that subject. Genesis 1, 6 through 8. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So they'll say, well, see, that proves the earth's flat. Of course, that has nothing to do with the earth being flat. But it, it goes with their whole model of, oh, well, the earth's flat, and it has this dome above it called the firmament, this ice dome or water dome or whatever. But this is false. When the Bible says, let there be a firmament, in the midst of the waters that divides the waters from the waters and dividing the waters under the firmament from the waters above the firmament. This is simply dividing the water that's on this earth, the water that you know is in the seas and the lakes and the rivers, referring to that being separated from the water that is in the atmosphere. You know, when we have clouds above us, that's water up there, okay? That's moisture up there, that's H2O. So the waters above the firmament are the waters that are up in the atmosphere in the form of clouds. That's all. The firmament is called heaven. Well, what does the Bible define heaven as? The sky, okay? Now, there are multiple heavens. The Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the, being caught up to the third heaven, you know, because there's the heaven as in the sky. There's the heaven as in, you know, uh, uh, space in a sense with the stars and the moon and the sun in it. That's also called heaven. And then there's heaven, the place where God lives. That's why it's called the third heaven because there are three heavens, okay? So there are also three firmaments, okay? There's the firmament in the sense of the sky, in the sense of outer space, and in the sense of where God lives, okay? So people just don't understand the word firmament because it's a word that we don't use in our modern vernacular whatsoever. But it's these, basically it's these layers as you go outward is, is what the firmament is. So you have a, a layer of water, where you're underwater, then you have a layer of atmosphere, and then you have water that's in the atmosphere, then you have another layer of outer space, and then you have where God lives. So again, 
This thing of the firmament being an ice dome, the, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible just says there are waters above the firmament. Oh, wow. It's, it's talking about clouds in the sky. Isaiah 13, 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. This is a verse that they bring up, but this actually proves my point. When it says the earth shall remove out of her place, again, they're the ones who showed all these verses that the earth shall not be removed. The earth will be stable, that it shall not be moved. And also verse said it shall not be removed. Why? Because that's talking about the whole earth. Whereas this verse, when it says the earth shall remove out of her place, is talking about an earthquake happening. If you get the context of Isaiah 13, it's an earthquake where the dry land is moving. The plate tectonics are moving. Isaiah 44, 24, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So again, they take this poetic language about stretching forth the heavens and spreading abroad the earth by himself, and they basically say, well, this proves that it's flat. Well, no, because if spreading the earth abroad by himself proves that the earth's flat, well, I mean, does that mean that hev the heaven is flat too? Because the heaven is also stretched out. So again, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's a double standard. They have the earth as some dome, but then, or I mean the heaven as a dome, according to them, and then the earth as flat, even though it used the same language about both, about both being spread out or stretched out. And again, the mistake of not distinguishing the dry land from the entire planet. Uh, Psalm 18.9, he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. Again, in 2 Samuel 22.10, he bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. Now, in the, in the video, the guy who makes the video, he mispronounces this as, as bowed. He bowed the heavens. And then he looks up bow in the dictionary how it means to bend something, like, you know, bowing something. It's not bow, it's bow. Okay, it's ba he bowed them as in brought them down, is what that actually means. But here's the context. Let me read you the whole passage in context. Psalm 18, 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. And darkness was under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Now, this is not a verse about God creating the earth, if you didn't notice. Because he says, well, he bowed the heavens. It's talking about when he created the earth, he, he bended it. And that's how he created it. No, this is talking about God coming down and bringing wrath and judgment. And he bowed the heavens at that time. Okay, It's not talking about God creating the earth or the heavens. And notice that it talks about you know, smoke coming out of his nostrils, him riding on a cherub and flying. Uh, he made darkness his secret place. This is clearly poetry. This is poetic. This is not literal. If you actually read the whole passage, that becomes obvious. At the brightness that was before him, the thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them and shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. So again, clearly poetic, but again, it has nothing to do with bending the heavens. It's he bowed the heavens. He brought them down. And that has nothing to do with the earth being flat, just like how many other verses we've looked at. No, there's not a verse in the Bible that says the earth is flat, period. There's nothing even close to that. But this liar has the gall to say, oh, there's 75 verses that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's fine. None of these verses prove that. Job 11, verse 8 is the next one that he brings up. It's, a, it's as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Again, that doesn't prove the earth is flat. Heaven is high, heaven is up, and hell is down. That doesn't prove anything about the earth being flat because no matter where you're standing on the earth, heaven is, or I'm sorry, no matter where you're standing on the earth, hell is deep below you. Hell is down because the earth is round. So wherever you are, hell's down. Job 11 verse 9, the measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Again, the misunderstanding that earth is referring to the whole planet. Here, earth is referring to the dry land. That's why it's in contrast with the sea here. The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Longer than the earth, broader than the sea. We're just talking about the length of the dry land. We're talking about measuring the dry land, measuring the sea. 
Job 26.10, he hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. How does that prove a flat earth? It doesn't. Uh, Job 26.11, uh, he didn't bring this up, but I'm going to bring this up. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. Again, so if the pillars of the earth are these literal pillars, then why say the pillars of heaven? Does it have literal pillars holding it up too? And Asaph standing under them, holding them? No. Job 38, 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare of vast understanding. Isaiah 48, 13, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. So again, they say, well, the foundation of the earth proves flat. No, because again, the earth is the dry land, and it has foundation under it, the bedrock that's under it with the bars or rebar or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's all that's saying. Um, let's move on. Or, or here's a verse too, Psalm 18, 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Again, proving that the foundations of the earth are talking about the dry land, the plate tectonics moving, not the whole planet moving. Okay. Uh, let's move on to Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me and where is the place of my rest? Uh, Matthew 5, 35, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Acts 7, 49, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Well, you know what? The earth being God's footstool, that doesn't prove that it's flat. They'll show a picture of a footstool and say, see, footstools are shaped flat with, uh, you know, four legs. Therefore, that's how the earth is shaped. No, it just means that God put his foot there. That's all that means when it says the earth is his footstool. It's that simple. Okay, uh, then they bring up the fact about the stars falling. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Mark 13, 25, and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Uh, Revelation 6, 13, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And they say, well, see right there, that proves that the earth's flat. How? The stars falling proves that the earth is flat? They say, well, that proves that the stars aren't as far away and as big as we've been told. Ergo, the earth is flat. Well, hold on a second. Let's say that the stars really were closer and smaller. That would not stop the earth from being a sphere, would it? So again, they claim that these verses prove a flat earth. They prove nothing of the kind. But not only that, this is not talking about the stars, what we know as stars falling to the earth. This is talking about what we would know as a shooting star, which are also called shooting stars, which are basically meteors crashing to the earth. So again, this has to do with perception. Just like when the Bible talks about the sun going up and the sun going down, the sun's not literally going up and down but that's how it looks to an observer. So John in Revelation is the observer and he sees stars falling. Well, what is he seeing? Shooting stars. He's seeing meteors. Now I've actually seen, obviously we've all seen shooting stars in the, in the heavens, but I've actually seen a shooting star then, you know, come into the atmosphere and burn up and, and, and hit the earth, a very small one, but it was, it was a pretty amazing sight on the desert to see that happen. And it was, it was breathtaking. You know, so obviously uh, the Bible is talking about, when it talks about the stars falling, it's talking about uh, meteors, a meteor shower upon the earth, you know, causing all kinds of damage and cataclysm. And later on in the book of Revelation, after this happens, it talks about the stars still being in heaven. And it talks about how, for example, when the fourth trumpet sounds, that the third part of the stars are going to be darkened and stuff like that. So the stars are still in the sky after this. When it talks about the sun and moon being darkened and the stars falling, it's not talking about what we define as stars. It's talking about what we would know as shooting stars or meteors crashing into the earth. But even so, even if you say, well, I don't believe it. I think it's the real stars are going to fall. That has nothing to do with the shape of the earth, whether stars fall on it or not. So that's nonsense. So then another proof he brings up in this video is the ancient Hebrew view of the universe. You know, and he puts up some picture on the screen of, of some, he didn't put up this picture, but you know, it was some, something like this or whatever, but he shows some weird picture 
and says, oh, you know, the ancient Hebrew view of the universe. But my question is, according to who is that the ancient Hebrew view? Some Christ-rejecting rabbi somewhere tell you that? You know, what do I care what some Christ-rejecting Jew says is the ancient Hebrew view of the universe? You know, why don't we just go by what the Bible says? Oh, yeah, because these verses don't really prove anything, so you have to invoke some weirdo Jew view of the universe that means nothing. But anyway, let's move on to the next actual Bible verse they bring up. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So here we see the circle of the earth, and they say, well, see right there, it doesn't say sphere or ball or globe. It says the circle. Well, here's the thing about that. There's no such thing as a circle in real life. And if anybody took a geometry class, they would know that. Because a circle is a two-dimensional object, and there is no such thing in real life as a two-dimensional object. Every object in this world has three dimensions to it, period. Okay, So a circle is a theoretical shape. And the only way we can describe a circle is just man's perception. You see, this right here is not a circle. This is not called a compact circle. This isn't a CC. No, this is a CD, a compact disc. Why? Because a disc is a three-dimensional shape. If you look at it from this angle, it is a circle. But if you look at it from this angle, it has depth. It has a couple of millimeters of depth there. Okay, so a circle is a two-dimensional object. So they'll pull up their, you know, picture of the earth, whether it's, you know, something like this or whether it's something like this and say, see, it's a circle. But hold on a second. All of these pictures are three-dimensional objects because they're not claiming that the earth has zero depth. They're not claiming that the, you know, because here's the thing, even if the earth is, is one inch thick, it's no longer a circle if you and and again this is just ignorance of geometry a circle is a two-dimensional shape the way they're defining a circle the way a geometry book defines a circle so again if you look at something you could describe it as a circle whether it's a globe whether it's a cylinder whether it's a, a, a cone see in order for a circle to to exist in the three-dimensional world it has to be either a disc or a cone or it has to be a sphere or it has to be a cylinder, okay? Because those are all three-dimensional objects, okay? So the definition of a circle is a shape. This is the geometry definition of a circle. A two-dimensional shape where every point along the edge is equidistant from the center. That's the definition of a circle. Every point on the edge of the shape is equidistant to the center of the shape. That's how geometry defines a circle. So what's a three-dimensional circle? Well, if we were to take this, for example, the globe, and we were to take the center of the globe, every point on the outside of this globe is virtually equidistant to the center. So actually the best three-dimensional version of a circle is a sphere. So when the Bible says circle, it's not saying, well, it's not a sphere, it's a circle. What they actually mean is disc or cylinder, but it doesn't say disc or cylinder. It says circle. And so this is every bit as much of a circle as this is. These are both a circle in shape because a circle is a two-dimensional description. And these are three-dimensional objects that derive from a circle. Now, they'll often point to Isaiah chapter 22, 18, where it uses the word ball and say, well, see, Isaiah knew the word ball. He knew that word, but he chose to use the word circle. But it says in Isaiah 22, 18, he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. So notice he's talking about a ball being tossed. Why? Because a ball is a toy. You know why Isaiah didn't use the word ball to describe the earth? It's because a ball is a toy. It's ridiculous to describe the earth as a ball. A ball is not uh, a shape that you would use to describe the earth. That's why we call the earth a globe or a sphere. We don't call it a ball because a ball is a toy that's being tossed and thrown in Isaiah 22, verse 18. Let's move on. Psalm 33, 14. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. So they say, well, how could God look upon all the inhabitants of the earth? It must be flat. 
No, because God can do anything. And the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and evil. So that doesn't prove it's fine. Now, this isn't one of their 75 verses, but I've had other flat earthers come at me with, well, what about when the devil takes Jesus into a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world? That proves it's flat. Okay, well then, does that mean that at the top of Mount Everest, you can see all the kingdoms of the world? Obviously, that was a miracle, which is how he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them in a moment of time. It's not because the earth was flat, it's because he was miraculously shown all those things. Because if you went up on a mountain right now, you can't see all the kingdoms of the earth. If supposedly the earth's flat, why not? So that makes no sense. Anyway, let me move on. Uh, I gotta hurry, but they, they make up a point about the four winds. He goes on and on, explains all this weird, stupid, irrelevant stuff about the four winds and says that it proves a flat earth, how? You know, Matthew 24, 31, he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Daniel 7, 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Jeremiah 49, 36, and upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them toward all those winds and there shall be no nation with the outcasts of Elam shall not come. Now, four winds is obviously just north, south, east, and west. The north wind, the south wind, the east wind, and the west wind. What in the world does that have to do with the earth being a sphere or flat? Absolutely nothing, of course. Then another verse they use is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So how does that prove a flat earth? Well, because they go into this weird, satanic, Kabbalistic, gematreia. And if you know anything about the Kabbalah, it's the mystery of numbers. It's where instead of reading the Bible and taking it for what it says as God's word, they take the numeric value of the Hebrew letters and add them up and divide and multiply and do all this math in order to find all these Bible codes and all these uh, mystical meanings. And this is of the satanic Kabbalah is what it is. It's something that no Christian should have anything to do with. We should just read the word of God for what it says and not try to find all these hidden esoteric mystical meanings. But they, he goes through all this, you know, Kabbalah, Gematreya, and he comes out that the numeric value of Genesis 1-1 is 3.14. Which proves, of course, that it's a, a circle, not a sphere. Because, you know, we all know, you know, pi r squared is how you get the area of a circle. But here's what's so dumb about that, is that if you look for the area of a sphere, or, or the area, or, or the, the, the surface area, or the, the volume of a sphere, you also use 3.14, you also use pi. So again, he's just preying on people's ignorance of math, like, oh, well, 3.14, that's gotta be a circle, not a sphere, because he's just relying on the fact that most of these flat earthers never got to the level of geometry where they're actually dealing with spheres. They, they were still learning the, the squares, circles, and triangles, because they never got to the high level math, so then he just preys upon that. You know, that, that's why they think it's flat, because they can't understand a sphere. But anyway, that's, that's it, that's every verse. I just went through all 75 of his supposed verses. I mean, I'm not sure it was really 75, but I wrote down every single verse that he brought up, and I've just shown you that none of them even comes close to even remotely proving that the earth is flat. And you know, let me say this also. It's funny how whenever you try to talk to these flat earthers, you try to talk sense into them, you can't get through to them because they, they keep moving the goalpost on you. Like for example, they'll show you a model like, like this where it's just a round flat disc where it's totally flat. And they'll get up and say, there's no curvature. There's not any curvature whatsoever. Look at it, it's flat, no curvature, right? And then you'll start arguing with them some more and then pretty soon they come at you with something like this. Now notice the curvature there. It looks like a chips and dips bowl, like where you put the dip in the middle and then you have the chips all around the edge. That's not flat. So according to them, we'd all be falling off. Well, are they saying that we in the United States are sort of sideways, kind of cocked to one side? Because if you notice the curvature there, that's what it would be. So they're constantly moving the goalposts. Sometimes it's just a circle all by itself you know, and uh, like this, where it's just a circle. And then other times when it's convenient for them, it's got a square around it and it's got curvature. Other times there's absolutely no curvature. It's completely flat. So they kind of just move it to whatever they want for that particular argument. They just keep changing. And then, you know, you'll start talking to them about how stupid the flat earth is. And then they'll just be like, oh, well, well uh, geocentricity. 
Oh, the firmament. They just start changing the subject to things that don't prove that the earth is flat. Now you say, why would you even make this video? Why even take the time to go through all these verses and debunk them? I'll tell you why. I am defending the word of God. You see, Satan would love for people to think that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat because the vast majority of people are smart enough to know that it's not flat. So then when they hear that the Bible teaches that it's flat, it causes them to just reject the Bible out of hand. You know, when my wife was unsaved, she was raised in Germany, and she thought that the Bible taught that, you know, that, oh, the earth's flat and all this stuff. And it caused her to just have zero interest in the Bible because she just thought, oh, the Bible is scientifically uh, full of it. So therefore, why would I listen to it? You know, then when I met her, I showed her, no, the Bible teaches that the earth is round. You know, it's, it's a sphere. Hell's in the heart of the earth. And I showed her, you know, Leviticus 15 about how God knew way more about sanitation and cleanliness and all the science behind that long before man had discovered that. I showed her where he hangs the earth on nothing. I showed her all this scientifically accurate stuff in the Bible. Then she was actually open to hearing what the Bible says. But these flat earthers are doing the work of Satan to basically make the Bible look stupid. And that's what you're doing if you're one of these flat earth people. You're going around making the Bible look stupid and literally people will go to hell because of this kind of deception where they, people won't even listen to the Bible anymore. For example, I had several people that I know personally come up to me and say, well, the Quran teaches that the earth is flat. Several people said that to me. And I went and fact checked it and guess what? The Quran does not say that the earth is flat. Now, the Quran's a stupid book for other reasons, but it didn't say that. But the vast majority of people who are Christians, when they hear that the Quran teaches that the earth is flat, they just automatically believe it. It's like, oh yeah, the Quran's stupid. Well, that's what the worldly people are doing when they hear that the Bible teaches the earth is flat. They're just like, oh, well, the Bible's stupid then. People have known that the earth is round for thousands of years, okay? People have been studying astronomy. If you look at ancient history, if you look at old artifacts and archaeology, people have always been very into astronomy and they, they did all the calculations even thousands and thousands of years ago and, and have always known the earth is round. It's only idiots in the dark ages who thought that it was flat, okay, 500 years ago. It was just a bunch of dark age buffoons who thought that, okay, and Roman Catholics and so stuff that, that were teaching that. Um, as, as part of their way of keeping people in darkness in the Middle Ages. But before that, people knew it was round, and after that, people knew it was round. It's that simple. But honestly, my message to you, if you have been sucked into this flat earth thing, is to repent of the wicked sin of foolishness. Over and over again, God says that foolishness is a sin. And foolishness means stupidity. Don't be stupid here. Don't be a tool of Satan promoting this garbage there are the people who are behind it. I think the people who make these videos like the 75 Bible verses or this Rob Skiba or whatever his name is, these people are evil people. They don't even believe it's flat. They're just doing this to do the work of Satan, just to make asses out of God's people, make them all look like fools. And he's doing a pretty good job making people look like retards. With You say, why are you so harsh about this? Look, because I hate every false way. It makes me angry to hear the word of God blasphemed. And every time you say the Bible teaches that the earth is flat, you are being blasphemous. You are making a mockery of the word of God and you need to repent of your stupidity and foolishness and quit making a mockery of the holy, eternal word of God that is perfect in every way. And I'm here to defend the Bible and say, no, the Bible does not teach the stupidity because there are people out there that are smart enough to know that it's round. And when they hear you say that stupidity, then they're going to turn around and say, oh, the Bible's stupid. No, the Bible's not stupid. You're stupid. And you need to get some smarts and quit talking about things you don't understand. And you need to actually learn math and science before you start trying to talk about math and science. And you need to start learning the Bible before you start talking about the Bible. Because knowing the fact that the ends of the earth is referring to the ends of the dry land, that's pretty basic. You know, so if you can't figure that out, then honestly, you need to keep your mouth shut. And so I feel strongly about this because of the fact that I feel that it's blaspheming my Savior. It's blaspheming the Word of God. And, you know, a lot of people would say, don't even make this video. Why do you even address it? It makes you look stupid. Well, you know what? I'm willing to look stupid by addressing it because it is, you know, you answer a fool according to his folly and, and you, you, people think you're like unto him. But you know what? I'm, I'm willing to do that because of the fact that there's so many videos on YouTube, 
hundreds of thousands of views where people are being sucked into this mass psyop, this mass uh, campaign of deception to make Christians look like fools. So, you know, somebody, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it.